It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. Things are going well here on the southwest side of Madison. It's good to be with you. We're planning on getting back to our study of the book of Acts tonight. And I'm looking forward to that. We have a few things to note. I want to hope to uh, hope to see you on Sunday at 9 or 11 for worship. We have the Sign Up Genius account for that for our members. If you're not yet a member or if your name's not on that uh, kind of pre-approved list, I guess we might say feel free to come on and we would love to have you even if you're not able to sign up. So 9 and 11 for worship and then Bible class in the middle at 10. And with that, John Long is continuing our study of the books of First and Second Peter. So a very good study that we've been having, and I'm looking forward to that as well. We have a few things that we need to remember in our prayers today. Let's continue to remember Abe as he recovers from the uh, moped accident last week. So I hope Abe keeps on getting better. And uh, Terry Brummel is also in the hospital right now. So she's got something going on. So let's be praying for Terry. And then also we have the uh, collection of school supplies for Kennedy Elementary. I know a number of years ago, we were at one of the neighborhood meetings, I think, and kind of overheard that there were, oh, one or two dozen homeless students that go to Kennedy Elementary, and there were some needs there. And so we asked what we could do. Uh, after school snacks from time to time, we collect those. But at the beginning of the school year, we try to focus on the school supplies. And so that list has been on the front of the bulletin for the past two weeks, and that deadline is coming up this coming Sunday. So this Sunday, September 5th, will be the last time for us to collect those for uh, at least this semester, this drive, uh, this effort right now. If you have any questions, get in touch with Melissa or Anne, and they'd be glad to help you out there. Uh, tonight, we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts, and Acts, of course, is just a history of the early church. It's written by Luke. He's described by Paul later in the Bible. I think in uh, Colossians, he's described as being the beloved physician. And so Luke is a medical doctor. He's writing about the life of Jesus in the book of Luke and then the history of the early church in the book of Acts. And so we are partway through the book of Acts at this point. Uh, we've studied the first 15 chapters in the ABCs of Acts. We've had the Ascension. We've had the beginning of the church in chapter 2, cripple man cured is the way we used to say that, but now we change that over to carried and cured for chapter 3. The man was carried by his friends, left there at the temple gate, and cured by uh, Peter and John. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in Acts 4. We had the empty jail in chapter 5, first deacons with a question mark in chapter 6. In chapter 7, we had the great hero who Stephen and his sermon on that occasion. In Acts 8, we had the Ethiopian eunuch or the Ethiopian officer asking, how can I? How can I understand unless someone guides me? And Philip, of course, went ahead and did. In Acts 9, I am Jesus. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, we had Peter liberated again. In chapter 13, we had missionaries sent out. So the first missionary journey begins there at the beginning of chapter 13. In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they were not gods, but men. You may remember the crowds tried to offer sacrifices to them, thinking they were Roman gods. And they said, no, we are men just like all of you. And then they continued to preach the gospel. Uh, last week in the first part of Acts 15, because some had come in and were trying to force the new converts to be circumcised, uh, we had the apostles and the elders coming together in Jerusalem to try to get some clarity from the Holy Spirit that, in fact, the old law is not binding. Well, tonight we pick up with the rest of Acts 15. We move into chapter 16 tonight as well. In the ABCs of Acts, chapter 16 is summarized by the words, Philippian jailer converted. Philippian jailer converted. And we won't get to the Philippian jailer's actual conversion this week. We're saving that for next week. But I just wanted to introduce it here since we're moving into chapter 16 tonight. And if you uh, find a better way of summarizing Acts 16 using the letter P, uh, I would invite you to let me know. I'd be glad to do some updates if we can improve on that. Uh, tonight, though, let's pick up with Acts 15, verses 36 through 41. Acts 15, 36 through 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, 
being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Well, up in verse 36, at some point after the get-together in Jerusalem, Paul gets together with Barnabas, and notice here Paul initiates what we now know as the second missionary journey. And so Paul chooses his team, and his chosen teammate at this point is Barnabas, the son of encouragement. In verse 36, Paul's proposal is that they go back, that they revisit the churches that they've established on their first journey to see how they're doing, uh, to build them up, to encourage these new Christians. However, the plan starts to fall apart when Barnabas wants to take his cousin John, also called Mark. Uh, by the way, there is some uncertainty as to the relationship between Barnabas and John Mark. It goes back to a word that's only used one time in the whole Bible. In Colossians 4, verse 10. In Colossians 4, 10, most translations, in fact, almost all translations, refer to John Mark as being a cousin to Barnabas. However, the King James Version uh, uses a different word. That, that one refers to John Mark as being a sister's son to Barnabas. And you guys might know I get a bit confused uh, by any relationship kind of beyond mom, dad, children, and sisters and brothers. But I'm pretty sure that if John Mark is Barnabas's sister's son, that that makes Barnabas an uncle to John Mark. So sometimes we might hear their relationship described as being between an uncle and a nephew. Uh, however, almost all translations now translate that word as cousin. Of course, as we learn more and more about language over time, sometimes we have greater clarity. And that seems to be one of those cases here. It might also be hard uh, to nail it down with 100% certainty, but Barnabas and John Mark are most likely cousins. Uh, it doesn't really change the meaning of the text in any significant way. This isn't some serious doctrinal uh, confusion or anything like that that we're experiencing here. They aren't even referred to as being related at all in this passage uh, here in Acts 15, but I think it probably helps us to at least know that they are related in some way. So that's kind of what we need to know here, uh, that Barnabas and John Mark are related, at least cousins although it might be an uncle and a nephew situation. Well, Paul talks talks to Barnabas about going on this new missionary journey. Barnabas immediately thinks of his relative, again, most likely a cousin, John Mark. And Barnabas wants to take John Mark on this journey. However, Paul is strongly opposed to this idea, isn't he? And his reason is John Mark deserted them on the first journey. And the reference here goes back to uh, Pamphylia. Pamphylia is that region on the southern edge of what we now know as Turkey. Uh, when Paul and Barnabas and John Mark went from Cyprus up to Pamphylia on that first trip, it seems as if John Mark perhaps got homesick. Uh, he might have been scared. Uh, we aren't really told. We don't have the details, but we're told that he does leave at some point right in there and goes back home to Jerusalem. Well, that left Paul and Barnabas to continue on on their own with a little bit less support than they were planning on. Well, here we are sometime later. Barnabas, here's this call from Paul. Hey, let's go on a trip. Let's go on this missionary journey. Let's go back to these places we went before. And Barnabas wants to give John Mark another shot at it. Hey, let's bring him this time. And Paul basically says, no way. There's no way we're going through that again. And to me, it seems that Paul is primarily concerned about the mission. We have a mission to accomplish here. I'm building my team, and John Mark cannot be part of it. He has proven himself untrustworthy. He is a quitter, maybe, is kind of what he's saying here. And so Paul is worried about the mission, while Barnabas seems primarily concerned about relationships. And that kind of sounds like Barnabas, doesn't it? So we need to emphasize, though, this is not a doctrinal disagreement of some kind. It's not Barnabas saying baptism is necessary and Paul saying it's not. I mean, nothing like that. That is not what's going on here. Uh, but instead, this is a disagreement over methods, the, the way they were to accomplish the mission. And so um, it was not necessarily sinful to either take or not take John Mark on this journey. Uh, biblically speaking, they have some freedom here. So this is in the realm of opinion, we might say, whether they bring John Mark or not. Uh, now, if God had said, you must take John Mark with you, uh, that would be another story. Uh, but as it is, this is a clash of methods, maybe a clash of personalities. Again, as I pointed out many times, Barnabas is the encourager. Uh, Barnabas is the giver of second chances, isn't he? Paul had been given a second chance by Barnabas, and 
And he's probably a bit frustrated that Paul, Barnabas is now frustrated that Paul is now refusing to give somebody else the same chance that he, Paul, was given by Barnabas. It's a little bit, I don't know, maybe hypocritical in, in the uh, eyes of Barnabas. I don't know what we might say there, but there's definitely a sharp disagreement. And uh, in verse 39, they have such a sharp disagreement that Paul and Barnabas, they actually separate from each other at this point. Uh, Barnabas takes John Mark, goes over to Cyprus. If you remember, um, Barnabas is from Cyprus, so he kind of goes back to his home island. And uh, Paul takes Silas and heads north through Syria and Cilicia. A few notes here, starting with the observation that they basically do what they first set out to do, and that is visit the churches they established on their first missionary journey, right? They do what they wanted to do. Barnabas and John Mark go where they started the first journey, they go back to Cyprus. Well, Paul and Silas go north, bypassing Cyprus, and they go directly uh, to those areas where Paul and Barnabas had gone on the first trip. And so instead of uh, one missionary team, they now have two missionary teams, and really covering twice as much ground as they could have uh, if they had not done that. And that, that's interesting to me. This disagreement, while obviously not ideal, uh, it was very painful at the time to see good brothers go at it and have this a verbal fight or disagreement with one another, uh, although that is sad and not ideal, uh, it actually turns out pretty well, and we're thankful to God for that. Uh, something else we notice here, uh, good brothers in the Lord, even working toward a common goal, can have a sharp disagreement over a matter of opinion. Uh, this wasn't a situation where they needed to be united, as they were with the issue of circumcision earlier in this chapter. But ultimately, the bottom line is they have some freedom here. And what I mean by that is God had not spoken on this issue. God was completely silent concerning who needs to go where and when. And that silence actually allowed a divergence of opinions. Where God has spoken on an issue, we really need to be united. Where God allows freedom, we certainly have more diversity. At this point, Barnabas and John Mark pretty much go silent for as far as the biblical record is concerned. We don't have the book of Barnabas telling us what he did, so they kind of disappear at this point. And Luke, in the book of Acts, uh, now focuses in primarily on Paul and Silas. Before we move on from this section, I want to put the map of Paul's second missionary journey on the wall up here. And like the map I shared a few weeks ago, this one also comes from uh, BibleTalk.tv. That's a website run by members of the Lord's Church, primarily in Oklahoma. So we're thankful to them for that. And they allow others to use their maps, their graphics without charge, as long as we give them credit, which obviously we are uh, thrilled to do. No problem there at all. Uh, this is a much better map than I could have ever drawn. <laughs> I would have had to whip out the crayons and uh, construction paper or something. It would have been ugly. So I'm, I'm thankful for a good graphic artist and uh, certainly beats stealing somebody's material from the internet and uh, getting in trouble with God, first of all. We don't want to be stealing stuff, but also with the courts over that. We don't want to go that direction either. And so uh, thanks to Bible Talk TV for, uh, for the graphics here. Uh, and before we move on, I just wanted to zoom in on this map a little bit. I've added that beautiful red line of my own. <laughs> and that indicates Barnabas and John Mark uh, heading up to Cyprus. So they split and uh, and so that's where this mission team splits up. They go different directions. So the green line starts in Jerusalem, uh, heads north to Syria and Cilicia, and then on beyond. I've also zoomed in to show where Paul and Silas are headed here. Uh, in the next few verses, they're going to head over to Derby and Lystra. We'll put the text on the screen in just a little bit, but I wanted to put the graphic here just indicating where they're heading. So they go north. Uh, through Cilicia, then they kind of hang a left up at the top of the Mediterranean Sea, going west over to uh, Lystra and Derby. And uh, these are some of the cities Paul visited on his first missionary journey. As I just mentioned uh, verbally a few moments ago, they're covering the same ground, but they've split up. So Barnabas heading over to Cyprus, Paul going north through Cilicia to uh, Iconium and Derby and Lystra. So they're, they're covering the same ground they covered uh, the first time. Um, so I just wanted to have some concept of kind of where they're going as we get into this next section. So let's continue tonight, skipping over now into chapter 16. So we're going to be in Acts 16, verses 1 through 5. Acts 16, 1 through 5. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. 
Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the elders or by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. As we move into chapter 16, then Paul and Silas make their way over to Derby and Lystra. This is where Timothy jumps on board. So we have some words about Timothy here. We talked about this a few weeks ago. As I understand it, Timothy is from Lystra. So this is the same place where Paul was stoned and left for dead. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, there's a chance that Timothy either witnessed this stoning firsthand or he was at least influenced by it. This is a well-known event. This is legendary, isn't it? Uh, Paul, the apostle, comes to town. He's stoned. He's left for dead. But he is surrounded by the disciples. He then gets up. And he goes directly back, right back into the city where he was just stoned. So that is a bold move. Obviously had some impact on the local Christians there, especially this young man by the name of Timothy. Uh, this is where we learn Timothy comes from a religiously divided family. I know a lot of you are in a similar situation, either coming from a family that's divided religiously. You may be a part of a family right now where one of the spouses is a Christian, one is not. Uh, maybe coming from vastly different uh, religious backgrounds. Uh, so we find here Timothy's father is a Greek and his mother is a Jewish woman who is a believer. So she's a Christian. And I wish we knew more about how these two got together. Uh, we don't know. This is about all we know. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.5, many years later, uh, Paul will write to Timothy and Paul will say, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And so we find over there that Timothy's mother's name is Eunice, and his grandmother's name is Lois. And so his mom and his grandmother were faithful to the Lord, obviously did a good job uh, passing their faith along to young Timothy. When Paul shows up, he sees Timothy. He wants Timothy to accompany him the rest of the way in the journey. And uh, here's another thing about Barnabas and John Mark. If John Mark had been on this trip, there's a real chance that they might not have been so eager to bring young Timothy on board, right? So Barnabas and John Mark doing their own thing uh, might have paved the way for Timothy to jump in. Otherwise, Paul might not have wanted to train a second young man and bring him up to speed. But that's what happens here. So they bring Timothy in. In verse 3, we find that Timothy is uh, circumcised at this point at Paul's insistence, at Paul's direction here. And that's a bit shocking, isn't it? especially after everything that Paul just went through on the circumcision issue back in chapter 15. And last week, you may remember, if, uh, if Galatians 2 is a description of what happens in Acts 15, as we discussed that possibility last week, uh, Paul makes it very clear he did not yield to those people for even an hour. And so Paul was very stubborn. They wanted to force circumcision. And just paraphrasing here, Paul says, absolutely not. You have no right to take our freedom away. So Paul was very outspoken on that issue. So why then does Paul seem to require this of Timothy? Well, as Luke explains, he does this because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. In other words, Paul does not have Timothy do this to, to save him in any way. This is not for Timothy's salvation, but this is clearly a matter of influence. He avoids causing offense of some kind. Later, I think in 1 Corinthians 9 is where uh, Paul refers to becoming all things to all men so that he may by all means save some. So when he could bend in an area of personal opinion, Paul could bend. Uh, but when it was on the truth of the gospel, Paul was unwavering. So uh, this is how far Paul and Timothy would go to reach people with the gospel, even to the point of having Timothy circumcised, even though it was not a spiritual necessity at this point. So they go out of their way uh, not to cause offense, not to distract from that message. Imagine if they hadn't. You know, Paul would show up with this young man. Oh, your dad's a Greek. You're not circumcised. It's going to be a problem. And then the direction of the conversation uh, would go there. In the rest of this first paragraph, we find one of the goals of this trip was to deliver this message from the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. That's the 
a message, the letter that we studied last week, and it goes well. The churches are getting stronger. They're growing in number. Uh, remember, at the end of the last journey, on his way home, Paul appointed elders at each of those congregations. And so now he goes back sometime later to teach and to strengthen and to encourage. And the churches continue to do very well. This is good for all the churches. Uh, it's good for Paul and Silas. And it's also a huge learning opportunity, a good experience for Timothy. Uh, let's continue tonight with Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Before we get to the text itself, I just want to put the map on the screen again. And I've added the names of several regions in red. These were not on the original map, so I've added the red words up there. There's Asia on the left. This is not, I mean, when I hear Asia, I think China, don't you? I mean, when somebody says I'm traveling to Asia, I think kind of around China. But uh, this is not China. This is the Roman province of Asia, as in the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. So on the map, we find Ephesus. Certainly Ephesus was one of those seven churches. And so we've got the reference to Asia. Um, I've also added Mysia and Bithynia, kind of up there on the northern edge of what we would know today as being Turkey. Um, in the text, we find that Paul and Silas and Timothy, once they leave Derby and Lystra, the Holy Spirit prevents them from heading into Asia, and they are forbidden from doing this. I'm assuming they were perhaps considering it. I mean, to be forbidden from doing something, you would think they maybe tried. And so I can imagine Paul kind of walking along the road and taking a left turn, thinking, hmm, let's go down here to Asia. But somehow the Holy Spirit kept them from doing that. Well, then they try to head up into Bithynia in that area. The same thing happens there. The Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. This is new to me. Um, I know I've read this before. I just don't remember thinking through this before. I think in terms of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but here we have a reference to the Spirit of Jesus, and I'm not really sure what to think of that. That's an interesting reference here. Uh, but somehow Jesus was not allowing them to go up to Bithynia. Well, they continue on. They pass by Mysia, and that brings them down to Troas. And so this brings them to Troas and uh, on the northwestern edge of this region. And on the map, when we look back at that green line, we find that Paul is prevented from going to the right or to the left. Do you notice that? As he leaves Derby and Lystra, he's kind of heading west, and he can't go left, he can't go right, and they end up in Troas. And so at the beginning of the journey, they're kind of pointed in that direction. There is a clear trajectory for this trip that they're on, although Paul didn't know it as he was going. Uh, this kind of became more clear along the way. We see a fairly straight line from Antioch to Troas, uh, heading northwest through this area. Down in verse 9, we find that in Troas, a man appears to Paul in a vision, and this man is from Macedonia. In my mind, this man is standing in Macedonia, and he's standing and appealing to Paul, uh, and he's saying, come over to Macedonia to help us. Um, we sing about this, don't we? We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. I won't sing it to you, uh, but that's a song that we sing, send the light. And so the, we've heard the Macedonian call today, send the light. As I remember it, my mom as a kid always thought we were singing cinder light, C-I-N-D-E-R, cinder light, as in the light from cinders in a fire, cinder light, cinder light. And I think that may be a bit of the, the southern influence going on there. Uh, to have people singing the words, send the light, but to hear the words, cinder light. And it's it's hard to enunciate that really clearly as we sing. It's a challenge for all of us. Uh, but anyway, whenever I sing that song, I, in my mind, I'm always thinking cinder light. But send the light. And, and the song is obviously based on this passage. And so the song is making a point, I think, poetically, not literally. We have heard the Macedonian call today. 
uh, figuratively. We have not seen a man in Macedonia saying, come and help us, but I think we know what's going on here. Uh, the people of this world are calling out to us, in a sense, and they're, they're asking us to preach the word of God. And so our job is to go out and to preach and teach the word of God. And so in that sense, uh, today, certainly, yes, we have heard the Macedonian call today. And our response to that is to send the light. Uh, this brings us to a key verse in the book of Acts. I hope you have perhaps noticed something in verse 10. The change in pronouns. Up to Acts 16, verse 9, Luke, the author, has consistently referred to the people in this book in the third person. They traveled here, and they did this, and they did that, and so on. However, do we notice the change that takes place in Acts 16, verse 10? In Acts 16, verse 10, all of a sudden, Luke mentions Paul seeing this vision, and then he says, immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that Luke has now joined up with this team of missionaries. So it's no longer them doing these things, but now it is us traveling and going from place to place. And we'll see a number of these uh, we passages scattered throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Not consistently. Paul isn't with Luke 24-7, they seem to uh, drop Luke off here and there, and then he'll catch up, and then he'll go back, and he has kind of missions that he's sent on. And so very sporadically, Luke will show up, and he'll join the team, and then he'll go off and do his own thing, and he's left behind for a bit, and so on. Uh, but this is the first of these we passages, and I'll try to point those out as we go along, just so we can uh, pay attention to those. I can't even remember exactly how many there are. Uh, but there are several. I don't know, six or seven or so is my first guess, but we'll, we'll look into that as we get to some of the others. Uh, based on this, we often assume that Luke is maybe from the city of Troas. Uh, some have thought that Luke might be the man from Macedonia. Um, come over here to help us, and then Luke comes over to Troas, meets up with Paul, and they go together. So we're really not told he could have been the Macedonian call guy. Uh, he could have been there in Troas, we really don't know too much about Luke and his background. He's a medical doctor. He's got a, a Gentile name. Well, that may or may not tell us too much. I don't know. Um, but beyond that, there, there really isn't a whole lot of information in the text itself. Um, in the big picture here, God is directing this mission team into a new area, uh, into Europe for the very first time. And Luke now joins up with them. So let's continue tonight with Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. Acts 16, verses 11 through 15. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Up in verse 11, notice how Luke says that we put out to sea from Troas and went straight across to Samothrace, to Neapolis, and then on to Philippi. And so we have this reminder here that Luke, the author of this account, is with the group at this point. So he's writing from his own experience now. Uh, this also reminds us that they are making a beeline for Philippi. They don't waste any time. They are on a mission. They go straight there. And uh, I think this takes two days. I think the same trip going back takes five days uh, on a return voyage. And so that kind of, it's interesting. They had the prevailing wind. It takes two days. With the wind against them, it takes five days. But uh, two days on the way over. Uh, we have the reminder here that Philippi is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. This tells us something about Paul's methods. Uh, obviously, he's following the lead of the Spirit here. The Spirit is directing him. Uh, but he's also making a point of going to leading cities. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Paul did not focus on tiny little villages out in the middle of nowhere, did he? Paul went to capitals. Paul went to important places. 
As I understand it, the goal was to establish churches in these leading cities and then let those new churches reach out from there. And so if Paul were to come to Wisconsin, and if no one in Wisconsin knew anything about the gospel, if we were hearing it for the first time, where would Paul go if he showed up in Wisconsin? Well, he'd probably go to Milwaukee, and he'd probably go to Madison. Nothing against small towns, uh, but Paul would probably not focus his efforts in Manaqua. Manaqua was a great, great place to visit, but I'm just saying it's probably not Paul's first choice for establishing a congregation. He went for the big cities, and then he let those cities and those churches reach out from there. That, that was his method. We'll see that throughout this book. Uh, Luke gives us another interesting detail in verse 12 letting us know that Philippi was a Roman colony. And that's unusual. Normally when Rome conquered an area, they would leave in place some form of local rule. They would just come in and say, okay, we're in charge now. Uh, pay us taxes, continue doing your thing, behave yourselves, and we'll just kind of move along here. You're one of us now. Philippi, though, was a Roman colony. This was not normally done. Philippi was Roman. And they followed Roman rule. They spoke Latin here, not Greek. Uh, it was located about halfway along the Ignatian Way, the road running from sea to sea across the region of Macedonia. And it was vitally important to have a strong Roman presence in that area. They had to maintain that road. They had to keep it secure. And so as I understand it, Rome gave some huge incentives to soldiers who were at the point of retirement. Have we got a deal for you? If you choose to move to Philippi, we will give you tax-exempt status for the rest of your life. No more taxes. And obviously, a lot of soldiers says, sound good, sounds good. <laughs> I'm on my way to Philippi. I need to save my money or whatever. So Philippi then had a significant population of retired Roman soldiers and other officials. It was a little Rome. In verse 13, Paul follows his pattern of starting his outreach with the Jews. And since there was no synagogue in Philippi, he goes to the riverside right outside the city gate. Uh, Jews needed some water for some of their purification rituals, so it was customary to meet by the river. That goes back many, many years. We have a few references to this practice in Psalm 137, Ezekiel 1, Daniel 8, Daniel 10, and maybe some others. But in foreign places, God's people would often meet by the river to pray and to worship. So Paul goes down to the river, and he indeed finds some women who had assembled there for the purpose of prayer. Uh, one of these women is Lydia, a seller of purple fabrics. If you've studied this before, maybe from world history, we realize purple dye was made from the gland of a mollusk, and it was extremely rare, extremely expensive. I mean, hundreds of these little critters just for a drop or two. Very labor-intensive to harvest and, and process the dye and all that. Uh, there's a good chance then Lydia is fairly wealthy, uh, providing purple clothing to royals and the wealthy. May remember, they put a purple robe on Jesus at his crucifixion to mock him for claiming to be a king. Uh, we also find in this passage that she's from the city of Thyatira. Uh, where else in the Bible do we read about Thyatira? Well, Thyatira was one of the seven churches of Asia. In the book of Revelation, Jesus sends a message to that church in Revelation 2, 18 through 29. Uh, some have speculated that Lydia perhaps goes home, that she's on a business trip over here. Uh, to Philippi, and then she goes home and brings the gospel back to Thyatira at some point. Maybe that's how the church gets started there. We don't know, just speculation. Uh, but here in Acts 16, Lydia, we know, is a worshiper of God. She's listening to Paul preaching. As she hears the word of God preached, God opens her heart to respond to what Paul is saying. We know from Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So Paul preaches the word of Christ. This woman's heart is opened to respond. Just a note here, the preaching comes first, then the opening of the heart. It's not the opening of the heart followed by preaching, but instead her heart is opened as she hears the preaching of the gospel. In verse 6, we find Lydia and her household are baptized. Oh, we need to realize that like Cornelius, some will try to use this to think they can prove babies can be baptized. The argument is Lydia must have had babies in her household. Her household's baptized, therefore babies can be baptized. That's what we hear. Um, the argument falls apart, though, from the beginning, though, because nowhere do we find that Lydia had babies in her household. Uh, that, that's an assumption with no evidence at all. As we discussed back when we studied Cornelius, uh, the term household may even include servants, uh, co-workers, anybody who is staying in that house. 
But even if it does refer to her biological family, and it might, uh, her children, if she even had any, very well might have been old enough to be accountable on their own. Uh, many of us listening tonight are, are at a point in life right now where our children are definitely old enough to be baptized. And so this proves nothing in terms of uh, little children being baptized. Uh, here's something else to consider. If servants are a part of Lydia's household, as allowed by how this word is used in ancient times, Paul would not have baptized them just because Lydia forced them to be baptized. Does that make sense? If Lydia said, okay, as a part of your employment, you must be baptized, Paul wouldn't have gone along with that. And I would suggest in the same way, there is no way Paul would have baptized children just because Lydia forced them to. Um, so the, the same argument is made from uh, the baptizing of servants against their will to the baptizing of little children against their will. Neither one uh, works out. A baptism is a choice that we make personally after hearing the word of God, after confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and after turning away from sin. This isn't a decision that somebody else can make on our behalf. Uh, so on the infant baptism question, we really need to go back to the purpose of baptism. We're baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. We know from scripture that babies do not sin, uh, therefore babies and little children have no need whatsoever to be baptized. Again, some have said, well, why not? What would it hurt? Uh, certainly it doesn't hurt anything. And in my experience, as I said about a month ago, the danger is these babies grow up thinking that they'd already been baptized and they see no need to be baptized later in life. I've, I've run into that personally. So uh, there is, in fact, a huge danger in baptizing babies. And uh, if invited to attend the baptism of, a, of an infant, uh, I can't do that. I can't participate. I can't even watch it. I, I don't want to give my approval to that in any way. Uh, this procedure that may very well cause a child to grow up thinking that he or she doesn't need to do what the Bible commands. So this is a negative lesson we learned from this passage. The positive lesson here is Lydia hears the word of God as it's spoken by Paul. She responds to the word by being baptized. That's what we know from this passage. So, I mean, that right there is awesome. Uh, then at the end, Lydia basically uh, forces Paul and his mission team to come over to her house to stay for a bit. And uh, how, I, I don't want to say manipulative, but uh, if you have judged me faithful, I can just see a, a smile on her face as she's saying that. If you think I'm faithful, Paul, you're going to come over to my house and stay. Um, you know how we sometimes go back and forth concerning who gets the privilege of paying for a meal at a restaurant. You go out with friends. Oh, let me get it today. No, no, no. It's my turn. I'm going to get it. You know, back and forth like that. Lydia would win that argument every time. <laughs> she prevailed upon us. So it takes a lot to, to outmaneuver, outargue the Apostle Paul, but this woman does it. She uh, uses her, her business, her negotiating skills uh, to, to out, uh, outmaneuver the Apostle Paul. Again, we know Paul was somewhat strong-willed. Uh, I would suggest tonight that Lydia was stronger. She used her wealth and her home to host the man who had introduced her to the Lord. Uh, next week then, let's pick up with Acts 15, 16. We're going to come to another interesting uh, scene in the city of Philippi. For now, the gospel has crossed over into Europe for the very first time. And as far as we know, Lydia is the first person to obey the gospel on the European continent. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can be present for worship this Sunday, either at 9 or 11, and also for Bible study in between at 10. Uh, this would be a great time to sign up. We're still doing that. It, it's really helpful to make sure we're kind of even and we're not too lopsided there with those two services. We want to still give people a chance to spread out, uh, especially with the coronavirus the way it is right now. We need to pay attention to that. So if you can sign up right now, that would be very helpful. And uh, let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only true God, a God who loves this world even to the point of sending your messengers to far-off places. We are in some of these far-off places tonight, farther than the people in Acts 16 could have ever imagined, thousands of miles from this place. And so we're especially thankful tonight for your love and for your willingness to make the good news available even to us here. We pray that you would give us the wisdom and courage to share your love with the world around us, even in Madison or wherever we might be. Thank you, Father, for Lydia. Thank you for her example of humble obedience to your word. Tonight, we're thankful for her example of hospitality. Thank you for the Lydias that we have in our Christian family here in Madison. Christian women, godly women who excel in science and education and business. 
Thank you for their continued support of the preaching of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for making us a part of your plan to take your word into all the world. Help us to encourage each other in the faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen.